Hello, this is episode one of this new podcast, which comes from the True Crime Nightmare podcast family. The new podcast is called True Crime Nightmare, Old Crimes from Years Gone By, and my name is Jane Reed. This podcast will explore crimes of murders, mainly um, either solved or unsolved, from the years 1850 to 1950. This separate new podcast show will cover much older cases from the UK and in fact all over the world. The cases covered will not have the same scientific advantages that are available now. Also just overall knowledge of crimes and mur- murderers will not be so widely known as they are today for obvious reasons. I have a few favourites so to speak but I shall also look at cases that I have never heard of before. It makes it much more interesting in my book anyway. The first case that I'm going to cover is the so-called acid bath murderer. This is the famous serial killer John George Haig from England. John Haig's crimes took place in England in the 1940s. He was a man who pretty much decided early on that he was not going to want to work nine to five for the whole of his working life. He decided that he would try to obtain money by other means. He did not care how he came about the money either. His crimes were seemingly driven by his greed and his murder count was put at six, although he would claim that he killed nine people in total, but that was never verified. John Haig was an only child who grew up with his parents. He was known to have lived a quiet and pretty solitary life whilst growing up. He was born on the 24th of July of 1909 in Stamford, Lincolnshire in England. It was known from an early age that he liked the so-called finer things in life, as so many of us do. The only thing was he did not really want or expect to have to work particularly hard to obtain them, it would seem. His childhood was said to have been quite difficult. His parents did not celebrate Christmas or believe in giving gifts at all. They were very religious. John Haig attended a Catholic school at Wakefield in England. He was known by those around him at the time that he was quite secretive. He also discovered that he had a talent for forging other people's signatures. This would come in handy later on in life. He committed some petty crimes fairly early on, which did include forgery by all accounts. He got caught though and spent some time in jail pretty early on. But how on earth did he move on to murdering people? It would seem that he did not really struggle with the concept of taking the person's life at all, especially if it meant that he would benefit financially from the murders, which he always did. John Haig did try normal jobs, but although at first he was always seemingly good at what he was doing, he could not keep it going for very long and would then turn to unlawful ways of earning money. John Haig had expensive tastes. He liked to dine out in the best restaurants and stay in the most expensive hotels as well. He also liked to drive the best cars available at the time. He also liked to wear the best suits, which were always expensive. He certainly liked to live a lavish lifestyle but did not expect to have to work particularly hard to achieve and then maintain it, it would seem. He was also always looking for an easier option. He did go on to commit many crimes. He would, on more than one occasion, start up false businesses. He would pretend to offer a product or some bonds and collect cheques from interested people but the actual product or scheme did not even exist. He would keep the money instead, close the so-called business down and then go on to his next venture. The so-called money-making scheme would not make any money for the person that or the people that invested. The only money he was making was by committing fraud on many unsuspecting people that had nowhere to go with their complaints because it was technically legal to, to do that anyway. He really had no redress, it would appear, at at this stage in his life. As these crimes happened over 70 or 80 years ago, it was much easier, it would seem, to get away with this than 
than it would be today. John Haig also came across as a charismatic man and he was always well dressed. John Haig was born on the 24th of July of 1909 in Stamford, Lincolnshire, which is in the East Midlands area of England. He grew up in the village of Outwood in the West Riding of Yorkshire area of England. His father, John Robert Haig, worked as an engineer and his mother, Emily, was a homemaker. John Haig's parents were active members of the Plymouth Brethren, which is a conservative Protestant sect. John Haig would later say that he had many nightmares which were religious in nature during his childhood, so he felt uneasy about it all, apparently. John Haig learned to play the piano at a young age. He would even go on to play the piano for two of his later victims. He was also known to be fond of classical music and would often attend concerts. John Haig was at, won a scholarship to attend and study at the Queen Elizabeth Grammar School in Wakefield. He also became a choir boy for a time at the Wakefield Cathedral. After John finished his education, he became an apprentice motor mechanic. It was observed by those that worked with him that he did not like to get dirty and that he would often wear masks, gloves as well as overalls to try and protect his clothes as much as possible, which was unusual at that time, not so much today. That would all seem pretty normal today, but back then in the 1930s, it was not usually done and would seem strange to some people. He left that job after about a year and took an office job instead, working for an insurance company. However, he was sacked due to being suspected of stealing money from the office cash box, which he denied. John Haig was only 21 years old at this point. John Haig married a woman called Beatrice in July of 1934. The marriage did not last very long. Beatrice went on to have a baby girl, but she put her up for adoption. John was in prison at this point, serving time for committing fraud. Beatrice divorced John shortly afterwards. And because John Haig's parents were conservative as well as being extremely religious, they did not appear to have much to do with their son after all of his problems he was having. John Haig moved to London where he knew there would be more opportunities available to him. This was in 1936 when John was in his mid-twenties. He would take a job as a chauffeur for a man called William McSwan. William was a wealthy man of various properties and also some amusement arcades. John Haig did not last at this job for very long either. He would go on to set himself up as a solicitor using fake ID in doing so. The name that he used was William Adamson. He would pretend that he had offices in Chancery Lane in London as well as in Guildford in Surrey and Hastings in Sussex. He had letterheading with all of the addresses listed. He needed to be able to convince potential investors that he sold shares at below market rates in order to sign them up. However, he should have taken more care when setting up the letterheads. He misspelt Guildford by leaving out the D, this making it Guildford, which someone picked up on and knew that it had to be fake because any good solicitor would not have made that sort of mistake. The police were contacted and John Haig ended up serving a few years in jail once again. John Haig was released from prison just after the start of the Second World War. He would continue to commit fraud and served a few more jail terms, which didn't seem to put him off at all. It was while he was in prison that he decided to commit crimes whereby he would leave the person that he was stealing from dead and that he would dispose of the body in acid and so that they would not be able to go to the police. He read up about a French murderer, George Alexandra Surratt, who had disposed of his victims' bodies using concentrated sulfuric acid in large quantities. John Haig experimented on mice and found that it took only 30 minutes for the body to dissolve in the acid. When John Haig was released from prison in 1943, he took a job in an accountant's firm to tide him over. 
Shortly after leaving prison, he would bump into an old friend and employer of his, William McSwan, in a local pub. The pub was based in Kensington in London. The pair became reacquainted and William McSwan took John Haig home to meet his parents. John was introduced to Donald and Amy McSwan. He discovered that they owned several properties in London that they rented out to people. Their son, William, looked after his parents' properties and collecting the rents for them, which in turn gave them all a very good lifestyle. And John Haig became extremely envious of this setup. On the 6th of September of 1944, while World War II was still raging, William McSwan suddenly disappeared. John Haig, after befriending William McSwan and meeting his parents Donald and Amy McSwan, had killed William. He had lured him into a workshop that he had started renting. It was based in Gloucester Road. John Haig then hit William McSwan over the head with a lead pipe. Afterwards, he put his body into a 40-gallon drum that had been filled with sulfuric sulfuric acid just for this purpose. The acid was concentrated and the body took about two days to dissolve. John Haig then just emptied the drum that contained a sludge-like substance and emptied it down a manhole in the workshop yard. This all took place within the confines of the workshop and the yard that was attached to it. The workshop was in a quiet location. John Haig came up with a cover story for William McSwan's parents. He told them that because their son did not want to be called up to fight in the war, he had instead gone into hiding in Scotland to avoid being called up. This was during the time when young men of a certain age, unless medically unable to do so, would be routinely called upon to do their so-called duty for their country. It was called National Service. William McSwan's parents must have believed the story because John Haig ended up living in William McSwan's house and he took over collecting the rents from the tenants. I'm not sure why um, it wasn't really considered that perhaps John Hay could be called up for national service, but there was no mention of that or whether, you know, John was so confident that he just didn't worry about that sort of thing and they didn't question why he wasn't worried about being called up as well. But anyway... He handed over the rent payments for the properties that they owned every week and they in turn paid him a wage for doing the job. However, a problem started to loom due to the fact that the war was soon going to be coming to an end. William Swan's parents questioned why their son had not returned home because they know that he did not have to worry about being called up anymore. John Haig decided that he now needed to silence them as well. He lured them to his workshop just as he had their son, William, ten months earlier. Once there, he killed them both very quickly with blows to the head with a heavy object. He then disposed of them the same way that he had disposed of their son. This time he used two drums, both filled up with sulfuric acid. John Hake then found that he had access to all of their money because he forged their signatures. He was known for being good at forging people's signatures, so this probably did not trouble him too much. This meant that he could access Mr McSwan's pension checks and he could still sell all of the properties that the McSwans owned. He made a profit of about £8,000, which in today's money was an awful lot of money. It would turn out later that John Haig had lured the McSwans to the workshop to, to see their son William, he had told them that he had returned from Scotland but was still hiding just in case. But obviously it was all lies and once there he murdered both of them. They must have been confused when they arrived and found that he wasn't there after all. After he'd finished off the whole McSwan family and obtained money which would leave him very comfortably off, John Haig moved into the Onslow Hotel in Kensington in London. John Haig was also a gambler and presumably not a very good one because he would often lose quite a bit of money. Just a couple of years later, in 1947, John Haig had managed to spend all of the money that he had got from the McSwans. Luckily for him, he became friends with a wealthy family, a husband and wife, Dr Archibald Henderson, and his wife, Rose Henderson. 
He struck up a friendship with them when he pretended that he was interested in a property that they were selling. He did not have any money at this point, but due to having expensive suits and a certain way with him, he managed to fool them. In reality, John Haig was just trying to work out the best way to get his hands on their money. He could be very charming and had come across that way to many people over the years. I guess that's what makes a successful con man in all probability. He was invited to the Henderson's flat for a party that they were holding. He even played the piano for, for them and for their guests at some point during the evening, all the while plotting their deaths. It was at this party that John Haig came across Dr Henderson's old service revolver and he ended up stealing it. Quite a few people still had their service revolver revolvers even if technically it was illegal but the second world war had only ended two years before so there was still a lot of guns around. Haig invited the Hendersons to his workshop. It doesn't say what excuse he gave them but anyway they both arrived. John Haig already had two drums ready for them filled with sulfuric acid. As soon as the Hendersons arrived it is said that he shot them using Dr Henderson's gun that he had stolen at the flat previously. He then disposed of their bodies the same way that he had disposed of the McSwans. The workshop that he used was not in a very busy part of town, so nobody had heard any gunshots. John Haig then did what he had done with the previous victims' possessions. He lied to obtain control over their finances. He even wrote letters to some family members saying that the Hendersons had moved to South Africa. He had pretended to be them and for a time he got away with it. He even kept their pet dog after he had killed them both. He just seemed to always have a knack of finding a suitable victim or victims and becoming friends almost with them before bumping them off for financial gain. He did not seem to have any trouble getting at their money and other assets either. It would be a lot harder to do today. But just as before, he went through all of the money and other assets really quickly. He was still living in hotels, dressing in expensive suits and gambling the money away. He decided that once again he needed some more money and once again he did not actually want or even expect to have to work for it. He just needed another victim or victims who he considered suitable to swindle and obviously murder. The money that he had managed to get his hands on from the Hendersons only lasted a relatively short time. Living in a posh hotel must have cost a lot, as well as he obviously did not want to drop his extremely high and lavish standards of living, it would seem. He noticed a few potential victims, but although he could switch on the charm, not everyone fell for it all of the time. However, it would not take him very long at all to identify a new victim, especially a wealthy victim or potential victim anyway. Olive Durand Deacon was 69 years old and a widow. She was a very wealthy woman and practically lived at the same fancy hotel as John Haig, the Onslow Court Hotel in Kensington, London. At this stage, John Haig was telling people that he was an engineer. This information helped set up a so-called business opportunity for himself with Olive because she had an idea to produce and sell artificial fingernails and needed some help. He had a different workshop at this point. This one was based in Sussex, roughly 50 or so miles away from London, but the workshop would still provide the same functions as before, which was to provide John Haig with a safe place away from any prying eyes to commit murder and to then dispose of the body. So after buttering her up for a short while until she became comfortable around him and with him, Olive Durham Deacon was invited to visit the workshop with the possible idea of using it to produce the artificial fingernails and that in a sense they would be going into business together. However, that was not going to happen because once they arrived together, In John Haig's car at the workshop, Olive was very quickly shot and placed in the drum. This was the 18th of February of 1949. The gun that he used to kill Olive was the same gun that he had stolen and used to kill the Hendersons, his last victims before Olive. John Haig stripped Olive of all her valuables, which included her jewellery and the Persian lambskin coat that she wore. 
She was then put into a large drum and then a large quantity of sulfuric acid was used to dispose of her body, just like his victims before. This time, however, it all went horribly wrong for John Hake. Oliver Durham Deacon had been staying at the Yon's local hotel with a friend called Constance Lane. Constance reported her friend missing after two days of not seeing or hearing from Olive. She knew that something was wrong because they would usually have their meals together at the hotel. Constant Lane was also, also knew that her friend had been on friendly terms with a fellow resident called John Haig. The police began looking into Olive's disappearance and quickly discovered some troubling things. They knew that John Haig had spent time in prison for fraud and that he had a history of theft. They knew that Olive was a very wealthy woman as well. They obtained a search warrant to search his workshop where quite a few items were discovered that pointed to John Haig having a hand in Olive Durham Deacon's disappearance. They discovered a dry cleaner's receipt for Mrs Deacon's coat. They also found some evidence of body parts located in the workshop yard. The workshop in Sussex, unlike his previous workshop in London, did not have such a good draining system. He would use a floor drain in the London workshop to get rid of the sludge-like material from the drums, but he did not have that option at the Sussex yard. He had to dispose of the sludge by pouring out the drums onto a rubble pile, which consisted old pieces of bricks and stones amongst other items. This was located at the back of the property. The police arranged for a pathologist called Keith Simpson to examine the area. The pathologist who was assigned to the home office identified 28 pounds of flesh, part of a human foot, human gallstones and part of a denture plate. This would later be identified by Olive's dentist as belonging to her. It would appear that John Haig was under the impression that because no actual body was discovered, then he could not be charged with murder. He was wrong in this belief, though, because if enough evidence could link him to a murder or a series of murders, then they still had a case. As it turns out, the police had more than enough evidence against him anyway. The game was certainly up for John Haig, and the so-called good times were definitely over now. The police also felt that John Haig looked out of place compared to many of the residents at the hotel. He was also a lot younger than the other people living there and so he in inevitably stood out to, to everyone and so especially to the police who were investigating Olive Durant Deacon's disappearance. He probably knew that the game was up by now anyway. That was not really that surprising considering the amount of evidence against him. His crimes were so well thought out and executed and in some cases it, was, it, it would take him weeks to actually go through with it. A defence of his san insanity was probably not going to come off, especially with the comment that he had apparently made to a police officer in relation to Broadmoor. He had clearly been hoping to once again fool people by coming up with a defence of insanity. The trial would take place at the court in Lewis, which is in the county of Sussex. He did plead insanity at his trial and he claimed that he had drunk the blood of his victims. He also went on to say that he had, from a very young age, he'd had dreams about blood and drinking blood. But who knows if any of this is true, it, it more than likely was just him trying to get out of um, being convicted and ultimately being put to death by the state. The prosecutor, Sir Hartley Shawcross KC, went on to urge the jury to reject John Haig's defence of insanity because he had acted with malice aforethought. Sir David Maxwell Fife KC was the person leading the defence and he called some witnesses that would testify to John Haig being mentally ill. However, the jury found him guilty to all murders and he was duly sentenced to death, so he was convicted of six murders. As is typical at that time, a death sentence was carried out quickly, usually within a few months of being found guilty. And John Haig was duly executed. John Haig was executed on the 10th of August of 1949. His executioner was 
Albert Pierpoint, the fam very famous um, executioner. John George Haig was 40 years old when he was executed. He had been convicted of six murders, the three McSwans, the Henderson couple, and lastly, Mrs. Durrant Deacon. There has been many... There have been many books and documentaries as well as TV series on this very famous case over the years, as you can imagine. He did appear to become very complacent with his last victim. He had been seen with her at the hotel and she was seen with him in his car. He did seem to take a lot of chances, but until Olive Duran Deacon, he had managed to avoid capture. He also made a mistake in believing that without a physical body, he could not be tried. John George Hake clearly wanted the so-called finer things in life, but had no real intentions of actually working for any of it. Hopefully similar, similar crimes would be detected much earlier on today and a would-be serial killer would be stopped much quicker, although there is no guarantee because the criminals also up their game to evade getting caught as well and have always done so. It's pretty clear that John Haig um, had a pretty good way about him, a very charismatic way around him, even though he had ill intentions towards people and he was plotting their deaths pretty much as soon as he met them. But he obviously had, he was obviously articulate enough. He was obviously able just to slot in with these people and to or not look too out of place, although Obviously, at the hotel, the police felt that he was out of place, but that was largely to the fact that he was a lot younger at sort of the age of 40. And a lot of the residents were, you know, certainly in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, so in that respect, he did look out of place, according to the police. Um, but he obviously did have a pretty good way about him to convince people you know, that he was one of them, really, and that he lived the same sort of lifestyle that they were living. And, you know, they obviously felt comfortable with him. And, you know, to go and meet down at his workshop, I know sometimes it was under false pretenses, but they, they went along there. But obviously it was too late by the time they realised what was going to happen to them. And um, that's how he got away with it. But he did have that mistake and belief that nobody meant that he, nobody discovered, no actual body discovered, meant that he would not be able to be convicted anyway. It could just be hearsay. So he probably felt pretty confident that even if he was suspected, he would not, you know, be put to death, certainly. Um, and obviously going for the insanity uh, by saying that he was, you know, he drank the blood of his victims and harking back to his religious upbringing and talking about nightmares that he had apparently had while he was growing up to do with religion and drinking blood. And obviously that was just a way of getting out of the death sentence, really, because that everybody at that time, unless they were deemed to be mentally unfit, would be sentenced to death and the um, death sentence would be carried out within a few months. It wouldn't go on for years and years and appeals put in and everything. It literally would be a month or two later, he would be put to death. And he was put to death by, you know, the very famous executioner and from an executioner family, really. But Albert Pierpoint um, was the person that hanged John Haig. Thanks for listening. As I said before, this is a new podcast to go along with my original podcast. I also have a mini sodes podcast that I'm currently working on and there are two episodes out of that already. I have recently set up a Patreon account as well so that you can, if interested, support my work and have access to even more content. Thank you very much. <music>
Credits for this episode go to Serial Killer Biography episode on YouTube, Wikipedia, a book called The Sussex Murder Casebook, and it's in chapters, different chapters on different killers, and it's by Rupert Taylor, and John um, John Haig is covered in one of the chapters in that book, and it has quite a lot of information. Anyway, thanks again for listening. Bye.